I want to start with a question this morning, and it's one that we hear often, and so um, it's not going to be a surprise to you, but my question for you is this, how are you doing? Or where I come from, it's this question, how you doing? Yeah, how you doing? I'm good, how you doing? So, I mean, but I'm, I'm, I'm being honest. Like, so we use it as a greeting. It's like a hello, right? And we don't even usually mean, like, how you doing? We don't want people to stop and answer this question, do we? Most of the time, like, we see people like, hi, how you doing? And people start talking. It's like, whoa, whoa, that's not how this works, right? Like, how you doing? It's just like, you know, how you doing? Like, that's all that is. It's, it's just a hello. So what happens when we break co- protocol? And in church this morning, I'm going to ask you honestly, and I'll slow it down because I mean it. How are you doing? How you doing for real? I wish I could sit down and have a conversation with all 120 some of you, although that would probably cost a lot of time and emotional energy. But I just want to give you space this morning to start with this question. How are you really? And so here's what I'm going to invite you to do. Um, I'm going to invite you to give yourself a little bit of a, like a score on how you're doing. Okay. If zero is like worst day of your life, right? Um, Your beloved pet, you know, had some terrible problem and you lost your job and you're, you know, Whatever it is. Okay. Zero is worst day of your life. I don't want to make you too morbid before we read Ecclesiastes. Um, Ten being like one of the most memorable and like healthy and excited and passionate you've ever been. Zero to ten. Go ahead and give yourself a score. You do not have to tell me, nor do you even have to tell your spouse if they're sitting with you. That's okay. We're not going to require that. But go ahead. Give yourself a score. And what I'm going to ask you to do is reach under your chair and pull out. Your scorecard. These, uh, these are temporary scorecards for which to uh, score yourself on the question of how you doing? How you, how you doing? Yo, Adrian. Oh, no, that's, that's Rocky. Sorry. How you doing? Go ahead and give yourself a score at the top. You can turn it whichever way you want. For those non-traditionalists, you don't want to use the lines. That's okay. Flip it. It's okay. For you at home, if you don't have a card, a little card and a pencil underneath your chair, which that would be a miracle if that happens, um, go ahead and grab a piece of paper and a pencil because you're going to need it. We're going to use this scorecard a couple different times throughout today. Okay? And here's, here's my follow-up question. Give yourself a score, 0 to 10, how you're really doing right now. I'm, I'm not going to collect them. You don't have to put your name on it. I may collect them, but don't put your name on it. How's that? How are you really doing? And then here's my follow-up question. Okay? Now that you've given yourself a number, what scorecard did you use to measure the quality of your life just now? What were the categories? Go ahead. Write them down. Uh, Was it job-related? Was it family-related? Was it health-related? Was it financial? Was it geopolitical? Uh, Was it whether or not someone sent you a big box of Doritos this past week? Like, How did you rate the quality of your life? What's your scorecard? What do you use to answer that question honestly? Not the one you use when you're walking down the street. How you doing? How you doing? Right? Like, not that. We're talking about how are you really doing? What categories of life did you use? I'm just going to stop talking and give you a couple minutes. I mean this. You you gave yourself a score, but what did you base it on? What were the things you were thinking about when you gave yourself a score? Some of you are refusing to give yourself a score right now, and that's okay. I get it. But if you gave yourself a score, what'd you base that on? You guys are actually doing this, thanks. Now, you don't have to score each category, but just write down some of the things that went through your mind when I asked that question. What did you base it on? 
Okay, who needs more time? Anybody? A minute or two? All right, cool. Thank you for doing that. Here's why. Here's why I ask you to write down the way that the categories that you would score your life is that because in the book of Ecclesiastes, we've been talking about meaning, worth, value in life, purpose in life, fulfillment in life. And what Ecclesiastes chapter 4 does, and that's the chapter that we're in today, the, the teacher, the writer of Ecclesiastes, um, does some, some really cool like life observations and lays out five different kind of categories that humans often use to try to score their lives, to try to figure out like how they're really doing, whether they're actually gaining in life. You ever had that question? Like, am I really getting anywhere with my life? Right? So the teacher, the writer of, of Ecclesiastes, recognizes that that's one of the burdens that we carry as humans, right? Trying to put a score on our lives, the value and worth, and whether or not we're actually going somewhere. And, and then all of Ecclesiastes chapter 4, he kind of delineates those, what I'll call five of the most common categories that we use to score our lives, to give our lives worth and meaning and value. And then we're going to take them apart, <laughs> one by one. But before we do that, let me just give you a little bit of a reminder of the history, right? The Ecclesiastes chapter 1, the, the teacher from Ecclesiastes, these are the two main problems that, that he's trying to help us solve. Number one, this great burden that mankind is never satisfied. Don't believe me? Ask a two-year-old if they want any more goldfish, okay? Yes, I want more goldfish. Yes, I want more gummy bears. Mankind is never satisfied. This is a burden that all of us can in some way, shape, or form identify with. And the second big burden is that mankind rarely finds meaning. Very, very rarely do you find someone who actually has fulfillment and purpose and meaning in their lives. And if you do, spend some time with that person and figure out why. These are the big problems that Ecclesiastes is trying to address. And then um, last week we spent like a whole bunch of time looking at the 14, actually technically 28 different seasons of life in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And one of the things we began to realize, right, and that hopefully you're seeing this, is that inside of us as humans, we have this innate desire to get ahead of nature, right? To stop the march of time, to stop the march of change, right? Um, like to control the things like weeping and laughing and scattering and gathering. Like we, we as humans seek to have control or dominance over nature itself. These seasons of life. And the very fact that we're trying to kind of exert dominance or control over the seasons of life tells us that we're not in control. Because if we were, we could control these things, right? We could at least know when they were coming, but we don't. So um, what we learn from Ecclesiastes chapter 3 is that we as humans, we, we have this innate desire to get ahead, to control nature. But then when we get to Ecclesiastes chapter 4, what we see from the right of Ecclesiastes is that not only do we have this desire to control nature, we have this desire to control everyone else around us. Oh, sorry. You guys want to go home now? Not only do we have this innate desire to, to, to get ahead of nature and, and to, to control the seasons of life and, and, and to have influence that way, we have this desire to get ahead of everyone else around us. To know more than other people know, have more than other people have, spend more than other people spend, right? Like, that's, that's the problem that we're facing in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And it's because, I believe, that we've got the wrong scorecard for life that we as humans have adopted the wrong scorecard. Most of us, okay? I'm not saying all of you. I'm not trying to generalize that all of you have a messed up scorecard. But in some way, shape, or form, as humans, we've adopted categories and beliefs about ourselves and about the world that have left us with this kind of skewed perspective on what matters in life and whether or not we're really worth it or whether life is good or bad. So here is my point for this morning. If you need to leave after I make this point, that's okay. But make sure you read Ecclesiastes chapter 4 because otherwise it's just my opinion. Here's my point. Living life backward requires us to embrace a different scorecard. 
for this entire series, 12 weeks in Ecclesiastes, we're talking about living life backward, right? Living with the end in mind, recognizing that one day we will all die, that one day our last breath will be taken and we'll have to give an account for how we live. And so each week we've been talking about what it means to live life backward. What, what living life backward, according to Ecclesiastes chapter 4, is it requires us to embrace a different scorecard, a different way of saying, yes, I'm okay, or no, I'm not okay. Yes, I'm doing well, or no, I'm not doing so well. This is what the writer of Ecclesiastes asked us to do. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to pay attention to the ways that people try to keep score in their lives according to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Make sense? See if you can come up with the five categories, right? We're going to read Ecclesiastes chapter 4, starting at verse 1. This is um, NIV. Again, I looked and saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors, and they have no comforter. Verse 2, and I declared that the dead who had already died are happier than the living who are still alive. But better than both is one who has never been born, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. And I saw that toil and all achievement spring from one person's envy of another. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Fools fold their hands and ruin themselves. For better is one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Are you starting to pick up on some of the categories that we as humans use to score our lives according to the writer of Ecclesiastes? Verse 7, and again, I saw something meaningless. Remember that word? It's that word hevel, smoke, temporary, fleeting, hard to hold on to. Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For who am I toiling? For whom am I toiling? You ever ask yourself that question? He asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is hevel, meaningless, a miserable busyness. A miserable business or busyness. Verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Better a poor but wise youth than an old foolish king who no longer knows how to heed a warning. (laughs) Thanks for that one. The youth may have come from prison to the kingship, or he may have been born in poverty with his kingdom, within his kingdom. But I saw that all who lived and walked under the sun followed the youth, the king's successor. There was no end to all the people who were before them. But those who came later were not pleased with the successor. This, too, is meaningless, hevel, a chasing after the wind. Okay, so did you pick up on them? I told you there were five most common scorecards, most common ways that we score our lives in Ecclesiastes. How many think you might have them? How many have them listed in your Bible, and so you got the headings? Somebody cheating? All right. We're going to spend the next few moments unpacking these categories for keeping score in life and whether or not they actually work. Okay? So here's the first one. You'll notice from Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, the teacher begins to talk about justice or injustice, right? And he starts to say, I looked and saw the oppression that was taking place under the sun, right? So that clearly he's talking about oppression, justice, injustice, whether or not men and women are being treated fairly. Does that have anything to do with how you look at your life? Does that have anything to do with how you score your life, whether or not you're being treated fairly? I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. This is the concern that the teacher has. Power was on the side of the oppressors, and they have no comforter. He's like, it's like double. He's, he's like reinforcing, like, hey, no one is caring about the underdog, the oppressed. Verse 2, and I declared that the dead who had already died are happier than the living who are still alive. Thanks for coming. Have a good Sunday. All this oppression, all this mistreatment, the teacher just says, 
should have just died. I mean, that, that, that's how desperate the teacher feels about some of the oppression. I mean, just stop for a second and ask yourself the question. What would happen to you if you could just experience, let's say, 50% of the oppression that's going on in the world right now? the injustice that's going on in the world right now? What would happen to your body? What would happen to your mind? What would happen to your soul? If you just had like multiple news feeds of video watching heinous oppression happening all over the world to children and women and families, I'd want to die. Honest, I would. Some of the most painful things that ever happen in the world is when children are mistreated. When the, the least de defensible are not being defended. Imagine if you and I could just experience that for you in a brief moment. The amount of pain in the world that comes to the oppression and injustice. I'd feel just like him. I declare that the dead who had already died are happier than the living who are still alive. Verse 3, but better than both is the one who has never been born, who has not seen the evil done under the sun. Okay, this isn't all that unusual from what our world is experiencing right now. People are having children later and later in life because they're not sure that the world's going to turn out the way that they think it's going to be. That they want it to be. They're not sure they want to bring kids in this world. One of my best friends from high school once said to me, Josh, I'm not sure I want to have kids the way this world is going. And many of us know what this is like. This is exactly what the teacher is trying to help us unpack. But it's one of the primary ways that you and I answer the question, how are you doing? Well, I'm not being treated. I'm, I'm, get, I'm being mistreated at work. I'm, I'm being mistreated at home. I, you know, I'm not being treated fairly. Right? That, that's one of the big ways that we determine how we're really doing is, is whether or not we're getting a fair shake. Right? Here's why. Because injustice in any of its form reminds us that we are not in control. Injustice, whether it happens to us directly, whether it happens to people that we love, or whether it just happens in the world, any form of injustice is this blaring siren sound that says, you are not in control. You're not. You can't fix it. You can't make it go away. And that leaves us with this kind of like potential for hopelessness. It's where the teacher is saying like hevel, meaningless, like smoke, vapor, that just about the moment we think we get some fairness brought to our world, then it changes again and something else becomes unfair. I saw the meme this past week, right? Just COVID finally says you can go somewhere and gas prices says, no, you can't. Right? It's just, just about the time you feel like, oh, I get the freedom to move about the country, but I can't afford to. That's just a tiny example of the injustice that is so far outside of our control. So let me just invite you to do this. By sheer willpower, could any one of you please change the gas prices downtown? Just close your eyes. Try as hard as you can. I tried. My kids want me to like start buying gas in thousand pound jugs and sell it to people. Is what this world that we're living in? We're living with so much unfair treatment, injustice, and every portion of it. And, and some things that we call injustice in the United States are just so very minor compared to the world. Okay, just so you understand, gas prices are ridiculous compared to some of the treatment that the world is experiencing right now. But every injustice. Reminds us that you and I are just not in control. Can't change it. Can't fix it. And so one of the categories that we use in our lives to say, hey, how are you doing? Well, am I being treated fairly? Am I getting a good shake? Gas prices going okay? Did my doctor figure out what was wrong with me? Like, right? Like, that's what we use. Justice or injustice. Here's the second one. Okay, so before I go there, reminder, Right? What's the conclusion of the teacher with regards to justice or injustice? Hevel, smoke, bleeding, hard to hold. Second one. So he starts with justice and injustice, and then Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, he starts talking about the meaninglessness, the hevelness 
That's not a word, but I'm going to use it. The helplessness of comparison. Verse 4, And I saw that toil and all achievement spring from one person's envy of another. Does anybody realize that? Most of the motivation that we have, especially in this independent North American culture that we have, is just so that we can get more than somebody else around us. The toil and achievement spring from one person's envy of another. This too is hevel, meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Fools fold their hands and ruin themselves. Okay, so let's, let's unpack just this statement, right? What is the teacher saying here? The teacher saying, it's mine. My house is mine. My job is mine. My future is mine. My family is mine. My relationships are mine. And you get these really white knuckles and the veins start popping out in your neck. It's mine! <laughs> That's what he's saying. Fools hold, fold their hands and ruin themselves. In so doing, because it's all hevel. Because we don't realize that the very vapor that we've got inside of our hands is gone before we even open them. Better, so his response is, better is one hand with tranquility, so one hand of peace, than two handfuls of mine. <laughs> That's what he's saying. What if we live with less? What if we let go? What if we didn't try, strive so hard to get more than somebody else around us? Wouldn't life be better if we just had one hand full of peace than two hands full of chasing? So much wisdom, so much truth. I, I read an article this past week that says in, the, in North America, now this is before the gas prices went up, okay. So but in North America, for an average family of four, once, an in, once that family reaches a threshold income of $60,000, once they hit $60,000, after $60,000, their quality of life actually begins to go down. Up until reaching 60,000, their quality of life goes up. Once they hit 60, then their quality of life begins to go down because you're starting to chase after the wind. You have to work harder and harder, and you're giving yourself more and more away, and your happiness goes down, and you begin to chase, right? So 60,000 is kind of the threshold for family of four in the United States, according to the article, and I believe it. But then I watched this, I watched this really brief documentary that was like an intro to a documentary by Will Smith, the actor, right? Will Smith, the actor, he came out with this kind of insider look on fame and fortune. And here's his words. He said, I had eight number one movies in a row that grossed over a hundred million each, and my family was falling apart. Eight number one movies in a row. Hundreds of millions of dollars grossing, right? That's just, just made above and beyond what it costs to make the movie. And my family was falling apart. You see, all around us, we can look and see examples of the truth of this word, that, that fools fold their hands and ruin themselves. Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. This is the comparison. And what is the authors say. It's hebel. It's smoke. It's a vapor. We think it's there. We, we think that chasing, we think that acquiring, we think that buying, we think that climbing the corporate ladder, we think that having a nicer car than our neighbor or a bigger house than our neighbor, right? Uh, having right, like with that comparison, that trap, we think it's real. And it lasts for a while. And then one day you wake up and go, whoa, I've lost all the things I thought I wanted most in pursuing what I thought I needed. Pebble, he says. Number three, advancement. I'm just really encouraging you today. <laughs> the three, so far, the three things that the, that the author of, a, of Ecclesiastes is trying to remind us that, that we search for justice and injustice and we use it as a way to decide how we're, our lives are really doing. And then comparison, then advancement. Verse seven, again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. Hebel, under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. Okay, what's happening? This, this individual, according to Ecclesiastes, has given so much 
of his life away so that he could advance, could climb the corporate ladder, could have the better job, the corner office, the 401k. Like, so how much does advancement factor into your evaluation of your life? Right? How much does that pursuit of a career or corporate ladder, how, how much does that cost? What we see is it, the man has sacrificed his family on the altar of career. Okay, so some of you know this about me. But for almost 15 years, 16 years, Susan and I served regularly as full-time youth workers. I was a youth pastor, and we served in youth ministry for 16 years. And I tried to go back in my mind and think about this for a while. But what I realized is, I couldn't even come up with a full number. I'm guessing it's got to be close to 100 conversations that Susan and I have had with young people. And not one of those children who were struggling and hurting, these, these high school and middle school students, not one of them complained that their dad didn't have a nicer car. Not one of them complained that, that they got dropped off at school in a Ford pickup instead of a BMW. Not one kid complained that their house, like the burden that they were carrying wasn't because their house was too small, but because their house was too big and empty. Not not one kid complained to me. like Their their life wasn't changed dramatically because they didn't get to go on that ski trip because dad didn't make enough money, but more than one kid complained heartbroken because they didn't know their father or their mother, their caregivers. Hundreds of kids over 16 years. Not one of them was adversely affected. Not one of them, their lives was torn apart simply because their parents didn't make enough money, but because they chased, their parents were chasing after the advancement. And they left their kids almost all alone. You see, when we use our career as a means to an end in itself, we wind up losing out on things that matter most. But when we see our career as a means to fulfillment in Christ, to support our family, to encourage those around us, to make sure that we have enough, but then are giving it away, right? Like what what the author is saying, like, there is no end to our toil if our chasing is, is the elusive career. Next one. Oh, sorry. There's a little bit more on this same verse. Verse 8. For whom am I toiling, you ask, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is, say it with me, meaningless. We'll use the H word. Hevel. There you go. I have a question. Do you believe that? Do you? Really? Do I believe that this kind of chasing is really meaningless? Hevel? Vapor? Breath? Smoke? Hard to hold? All right. Number four. Independence. (laughs) So... The writer of Ecclesiastes starts talking about these different categories that we use, justice and injustice, comparison, advancement. Then he goes on to independence, verse 9. Two are better than one because they... Okay, wait, wait, wait. I forgot this part. This is the only one out of the five categories out of the five categories that, that the teacher of Ecclesiastes gives us is the only one that's stated in the positive. It's kind of cool. It seemed a little bit morbid, right? Like, better off that they were dead or never been born, right? Like, it's all meaningless. Well, even the teacher of Ecclesiastes gets tired of the morbidity, and he starts talking in positive, right? So what we're going to see 
what we're going to see is that, is that this idea of, of independence, is, it's going to be stated in such a way that it actually is designed to encourage us. It says, verse 9, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. But if either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Verse 11, also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. This is a refreshing change <laughs> from the morbidity and, and darkness of, of Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And, and what he says is like, look, something that isn't, he doesn't know where, one word that isn't found in these four verses is meaningless, hevel. It's not there. He's saying there is value and having relationships, what he calls it, and I'll call it, you know, I give it this definition, interdependent, right? Interdependent is that a mutual reliance agreed upon by two or more people, okay? So there's, there's three types of, like, relational dependence that we as humans have, by and large. We have interdependent, which means that we enter into a relationship with a person. They agree to create a mutual reliance or dependency on each other. Then on the one side, we have Far side over here, we've got codependence, where people can't live without each other, and it's really unhealthy, and they're like contributing to each other's madness because they can't imagine their lives without them. That's a codependency. Many of us know what that looks like. We've seen it in some way, shape, or form. In the middle, we have interdependency. And finally, on the far side, we have what they call independent. And independency is actually, this is what, you know, we as Americans, we like to honk on this horn. That, that we would be free from outside control, that we would not rely on anyone for our livelihood or substance. Does that sound like us at all? You see, either danger, either extreme is dangerous. Codependency is really unhealthy. Independence, though, we think it's the most important thing about being an American. No offense, I like America, okay, just so you understand. I love living in America. I don't even mind the gas prices because I get good food, right? Like, I, I'm not trying to beat up America. I was born and raised here. My father fought in some wars for our independence, okay? So you've got to understand, I'm, I'm not trying to slam America. I am trying to ask us very carefully, in what ways have we accepted a scorecard that isn't helping us? So the codependence, very unhealthy. Independence, whether we like it or not, is not all that healthy. It's really very unhealthy because it's a subtle form of pride. And in fact, we, we even apply it into our relationship with God, right? This independence that, that we could, would be free from outside control. So what the, what the author of Ecclesiastes is inviting us is to an interdependence, a mutual reliance agreed upon by two or more people. Friends, this is what a good marriage is. This is what a good friendship is. This is what a good church is. Interdependence. Where we can speak our needs. We can pray for each other. We can support each other. We don't allow people to say and do things that we know are ridiculously unhealthy. We don't allow people to stray so far away, get lost in their own selfish pride, but that we'd be interdependent. This is what the writer of Ecclesiastes is inviting you and I to consider. So can I ask you a question? Raise your hand if you like to ask for help. Go ahead. Oh, wow. One person. We're, we're humans. And our scorecard... Whether we like it or not, when we answer the question, how are you doing, what we're really wondering is like, oh, man, can I do it myself? That's what one of the big categories. Am, am I handling my life on my own? Do I have to ask for help? Do I need support from anybody else? None of us like to ask for help. That's the reality. But according to the writer of Ecclesiastes and according to the way it is to walk in a relationship with Jesus, interdependence is a mutual reliance agreed upon by two or more people that is designed by God. From the first creation of humanity, if, if man was supposed to be independent, Eve would never have been created. Do you understand that? If man was supposed to be autonomous, independent, 
able to run his own life, he would have never created a woman. But from the earliest moments of time, God created this interdependent relationship between a man and a woman to reflect the interdependent relationship that we must have with God. Not that God needs us, but that we need him. And if we're living in independence or codependence, we don't even know it. Last one. Status. Okay, here's the five. Most common scorecards for our lives. Justice and injustice, comparison, advancement, independence, and then status. How the world perceives us. How the people around us see us. Ecclesiastes 4, 13 to 16. Better a poor but wise youth than an old but foolish king who no longer knows how to heed a warning. How many of us agree with that statement? Wouldn't you just rather be rich and dumb? (laughs) Yeah, go ahead. Shake your head. No, I guess I would. I'd rather be stupid and have a lot of money. (laughs) Okay, let's, let's just be honest. We're living by a defunct scorecard. What the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying, better a poor but wise youth than an old but foolish king who no longer knows how to heed a warning. Verse 14, the youth may have come from prison to kingship or may have been born in poverty within his kingdom. Doesn't matter where your start is, is what the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying. Doesn't matter where, what family you were born into, what part of the world you were born into, how much poverty you were born into, or how much wealth you were born into, all of the things that make up what our status is like. It doesn't matter because, verse 15, I saw that all who lived and walked under the sun followed the youth, the king's successor. There was no end to all the people who were before him. Right? Remember, time marches on. But those who came later were not pleased with the successor. This too is Hebel, a chasing after the wind. The fact that 100 years from the day that you die, no one will remember your name on this earth. That we all have the same expiration date. Maybe our numbers are different, but we're all got a date stamped. And so this chasing after this image of success, this chasing after this status where people think certain of us, that we're funny or that we're wise or that we're whatever, hardworking, you fill in the blank. What is it that you want the world most to think about you? And the writer of Ecclesiastes says, Hevel, smoke, vapor. You could hold it for a little while and then it's gone. Romans 2.29 says it this way, A person with a changed heart seeks praises from God and not from people. A person with a changed heart seeks praises from God and not from people. I love and hate that verse. <laughs> Are our hearts being changed? Is our scorecard being reevaluated? Have we considered the ways in which our desire for the world to think of us as funny, smart, hardworking, rich, right? Is, is our desire for status, is, is it keeping us from seeking the praise of God? while simultaneously running after the praise of others. The writer says it's all hebel. Vapor, smoke. There for a moment and then it's gone. Because of the two primary burdens of mankind. Number one, we are never satisfied. And number two, we so very rarely find meaning. And so all of these pursuits, right? All, all, all these running afters, right? Justice and comparison, advancement, independence and status, right? We're we're just never satisfied. No matter how rich we get, no matter how much hair we have, no matter how many cars we own, our houses, vacations we go on, careers we advance, there's this emptiness, this gnawing inside. 
because we're never satisfied and we rarely find meaning. G.K. Chesterton says it this way, there are two ways to get enough as humans. One is to accumulate more. The other is to desire less. You choose. That's the only two ways. That we are going to get enough. There's this like vacuum inside of our souls of wanting more influence, wanting more power, wanting more independence, wanting more status, wanting more worth. And all of that is being allowed by God so that we would seek him. And so we have two choices. We either get enough by trying to get more and more and more and more, or we get enough by desiring less. I can tell you there's only one way that actually works. There's really only one. And it isn't the first one. Because living a life backward requires us to embrace a different scorecard. To embrace a different scorecard. Can I tell you how I know? I've wrestled with this all week long, whether or not I was going to tell you this story. So if you stayed for the end, congratulations. But the reason I know that living life backwards requires us to embrace a different scorecard is because I've climbed the ladders. Because I peeked up over the top. Because I've seen what's at the top in my own life. Most of you don't know how I got to countersport. Some of you might. But my journey to countersport, it was a uniquely painful one for me and for my family. I've been in full-time Christian ministry, quote-unquote, a pastor for 24 years. In 24 years, I've worked in four different churches. And in all of those seasons, this is my fourth church, the previous three, I can tell you, what happened in those environments is that God gave me a level of success or I just... Worked harder probably than I should have. But each success in ministry led to another one, another opportunity, another place for me to go, another ministry for me to lead, another church to be a part of. My mom used to call it the curse of efficiency. The more you did well, the more they gave you to do. And for those of you who have never been in ministry full time, I can tell you something. There is never a lack of things to do when it comes to church. And the church that I was in just before I, I came to this one, I, I'm not going to speak poorly about that church, but it was, it was a challenging environment for Susan and I. I started out, my job was just to run the high school, high school ministry. I was about a dozen years ago, right? I think. About 10, 12 years ago, they called me to, to run the high school ministry. What you don't know is a church of about 1,600 people on a Sunday at that point. The youth group had not, this is going to sound so arrogant, but the youth group had more kids in it than our church does. And I had worked hard as a youth pastor, and I had all kinds of opportunities to serve in all kinds of different places. I would pull off these massive events for hundreds of kids. We'd fly in different bands and speakers and all kinds of stuff. And, you know, in the region that I was living in, you know, I, I was chasing. I was chasing after it all. So I got called to this new church. And in the seven years that I, I worked at that church, my job changed seven times in seven years. I started out running high school, and then high school, middle school, and high school, middle school, and college. You get that, right? Then I started running the internship program. By the time I was done, the last two and a half years I was at that church, I was overseeing all 30 staff members 
I was the executive pastor. I was managing four and a half million dollars a year with 30 different staff. Church of a couple thousand people. And I was miserable. Absolutely miserable. Making more money than I've ever made in my entire life. Managing more people. Taking care of more problems than I've ever done in my life. And at 42 years old, I woke up and I was absolutely miserable. And nearly lost my family because of it. What I can tell you is that living life backward requires us to embrace a different scorecard. I've been to the proverbial top of the field that I've been in. This sounds arrogant. Some of the famous people that you guys think are like these Christian famous people, I had their cell phone numbers, right? Like these are the kinds of relationships I was having. And it was meaningless. All around me. In that last year before I left that last job, five of my closest friends who've written books, who the world knows about, the Christian world knows about, five of my closest friends, their ministries fell apart, their marriages fell apart, their families fell apart for all different kinds of reasons. These are all guys my age, between 38 and 40. 42, their their lives just hit the wall, exploded in front of me. And by God's grace, about an inch before I hit the wall, God pulled me away. Living life backward requires us to embrace a different scorecard. If we're constantly chasing the comparison or the influence or the justice, or the independence, or the status, we will forever be dissatisfied. Stop chasing the wind, dear friends. Stop thinking that the future is going to be better than the present. Or maybe you need to stop thinking that the past is better than the present. Stop measuring success by your independence or your status or your wealth or your control. Stop thinking if only things in life were different that you'd be a better person, a better father, a better husband, a better wife. Here's some recommendations, okay? Three ways for us to begin to embrace a different scorecard. How do we do this? Number one, we have to honestly assess our own scorecard, okay? Pick up your card again, even though you don't want to. Go back over your categories and ask yourself this question. I mean this. If you don't hear anything else I say today, ask yourself this question. Is my current scorecard working? Is it working? Are things turning out the way I want it to? Am I happy? Am I fulfilled? Do I sense meaning and value and purpose in my life? Okay? Just ask that question. And I'm not going to predispose an answer. Here's here's my response. If it's working, honestly, great. Keep working that scorecard and maybe share it with other people. Right? If If you've done the hard work of recategorizing what matters, right? If you've done the hard work of of resetting your scorecard and things are working for you, so cool. Please send me an email. I want to know what your scorecard looks like. I mean this. And start sharing with other people because it's rare that many of us look at our scorecard and go, yeah, it's working well. If it is working well for you, please share it. If not, perhaps it's time for you to get a new scorecard. Perhaps you need different categories. Perhaps you need different measurements. Perhaps we need some evaluation. Here's my second step, right? First one starts with honestly evaluating your current scorecard. Second one starts with asking Jesus where you need a new one, okay? Some of us, we don't even know that we don't know. Some of us have have so completely swallowed the North American mindset of more more power, more wealth, more influence, we don't even know 
that we have a defunct scorecard. And so it's important for us to invite Jesus into a new one, right? David Gibson puts it this way. The universe that you inhabit and the life that you have today come from God's hands as something that you and I don't deserve. Your life is on loan for a short time, and one day God will call time and take it back. This is the truth of all humanity. So have you invited Jesus to help you put a new scorecard in place? And here's the last one. Ask Jesus where you need a new one and then invite the Holy Spirit and trusted friends to help you rewrite your scorecard. It's right in the middle of Ecclesiastes, that that center section, right, about interdependency is that we need each other as brothers and sisters in Christ to help us even understand what we really think matters to us and what should matter, right? So we, we lay our lives, our scorecard before the Holy Spirit and before our friends and say, hey, should this really matter as much as it does to me? Should this have this much power over me? Invite people who love Jesus and love you into that process, that interdependency. Because living life backward requires us to embrace a different scorecard. And it starts with evaluating our own scorecard. Asking Jesus where we need a new one and inviting the Holy Spirit and trusted friends to help us rewrite our scorecard. I'm going to close with Psalm 49. It's not going to be on the screen, but I'm praying that it will be on your heart today. Listen to this, all you people. Pay attention, everyone in the world, high and low, rich and poor. Listen, for my words are wise and my thoughts are filled with insight. I've listened carefully to many proverbs and and solved riddles with inspiration. Why should I fear when trouble comes, when enemies surround me? For they trust in their wealth and boast in great riches, yet they cannot redeem themselves from death by paying a ransom to God. (laughs) I love that line. We cannot redeem ourselves from death by paying a ransom to God. No price is high enough. Redemption does not come so easily, for no one can pay enough to live forever and never see the grave. Those who are wise must finally die, just like the foolish and senseless, leaving all men, all their wealth behind. The grave is their eternal home where they will stay forever. They may name their estates after themselves, but their fame will not last. They will die, just like animals. This is the fate of fools, though they are remembered as being wise. Like sheep, they are led to the grave, where death will be their shepherd. The bodies will rot in the grave, far from the ground, from their grand estates. But as for me, God will redeem my life. But as for me, God will redeem my life. Would you pray with me? God, we, many of us, we, we have scorecards that need some serious reevaluation. Many of us, we walk with these scorecards that, that we think are going to get us somewhere and they wind up just being hevel at the end. So, Heavenly Father, if you're speaking directly to any one of the people in this room today or worshiping with us online, God, would you give them space 